Thank you, thank you. Hey, it's been so good to see uh, all the faces back on campus. We have an awesome, awesome chapel plan for you. Uh, one of my favorite communicators is actually in our neck of the woods uh, and is going to share with us this morning. Not a stranger to the King's Academy. As a matter of fact, two sons go here to King's. Uh, he's a campus pastor at Palm Beach Atlantic University. He also is a teaching pastor with Family Church uh, and agreed to come and share with us to start off this new year. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then uh, would you join me in welcoming Pastor Bernie Cueto to share with us in chapel today. Let me pray for us real quick, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for another opportunity. I pray that this would not be just another chapel, but a special encounter with you, that through your word you would change lives, uh, not just for today, not just for this week, but for forever. So I ask that you would give uh, the people in this room just an uncanny ability to pay attention, and to focus, that through all the distractions and all the things that are going on, that you would speak to us through your word, that you would allow real life change to happen, and that you would bless our time that we share together today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Is this for me? Yeah, Merry Christmas. Free iPhone. Hey, good morning. Well, just as uh, Pastor Steven said, my name is Bernie Cueto. I get to be the uh, campus pastor at Palm Beach Atlantic University, and I teach there as well. Um, and I'm a teaching pastor at Family Church's uh, Gardens Campus. I'm from Miami, Florida, 305, born and raised. And um, I'm married. My wife's name is Anna. We've been married 19 years this past November. Uh, I married up, and I got three kids, uh, Bernie, Nicholas, and uh, Sophia. Bernie and Nick, they attend the King's Academy. They are lions. Roar. And um, uh, play some sports here, which we're very proud of. And uh, Sophia is our princess. She's 11. She's not going to come to school here. I'm going to homeschool her until she's 47. She's all mine. Um, when I was uh, in high school, God called me to full-time ministry, and I didn't want to do it. Uh, I wanted to go into law. It's what my family did. Uh, for four generations where we came from in Cuba, and, uh, and they did well, and uh, we didn't do so well because my parents had to not go to school because they had to leave the island of Cuba, and uh, I said, I'm going to go to law, I'm going to make money. Uh, I didn't love the law, but I loved money. I wanted to have a nice car, a nice house. Uh, don't get me wrong, I love Jesus, and I was going to give tons of money to the church, but I wanted to find that kind of security and that career, and it was right around your age where I felt the Holy Spirit uh, nudging me. Uh, I never heard his voice audibly, uh, but I heard it louder. And I want you to just listen. Uh, just listen to him, not to me, uh, not to musicians and incredible vocalists. Just listen to the Holy Spirit and see if he's nudging you this morning. Also, in high school, I started having these terrible headaches. And uh, I didn't know what they were. So I went to one doctor, and one doctor said they were migraines. And so they gave me migraine medicine, but it never really worked. I went to another doctor, and he said it was uh, muscle spasms from working out so much, which made me feel good about myself. Everybody laughed. So they would give me muscle relaxers, which I would take. Uh, I would feel really good about taking muscle relaxers constantly. But um, they didn't help my headache. Finally, I went to see another doctor who ended up becoming my father-in-law. It was kind of weird. It was my girlfriend at the time, my wife. Uh, her dad was a physician. And I needed to get a physical for work. And I said, hey, I need to get this physical. If I don't get the physical done, um, I'm not going to get paid. So I need you to just sign this uh, piece of paper saying that I'm healthy. And uh, he said, no, it doesn't work that way. I need to do a physical. I said, I've had physicals before. I'm not coughing for you. You're not touching me. Just, I need you to sign this piece of paper. So, he, some of you know what that means, and uh, others will figure it out eventually. And, and so, um, so uh, he, he kind of did a physical. And as I was leaving 
his uh, office, he said, is there anything else, anything you haven't told me? I go, no, I get headaches, but I've had headaches uh, for years now. And they're migraines. And he stopped me, he made me sit down, and he said, describe the migraine. And I said, it lasts um, a few minutes. Uh, sometimes I'll tear up, I'll get goosebumps. Twice I've passed out because of the pain. And he said, who told you those were migraines? I said, well, my mom gets migraines and some physician said that. And he said, those aren't migraines. I'm gonna send you to get an MRI. And so I got an MRI, it was a contrast MRI. I don't know if anybody's ever got, gotten an MRI before, but back then they kind of put you in this, it looks like a coffin. It's white, but it's a coffin. And, uh, and they tell you to relax. <laughs> and then they say, don't worry, we're gonna put some music on. And they put elevator music, that's horrible. And they say, just, just calm down and, and, uh, and relax. And then they slip me in the tube and they turn the MRI on and it sounded like this. For half an hour, it felt like people were trying to come out of the coffin and, uh, and attack me. Uh, the results of the MRI came back and they said I had a, a, what's called a Chiari malformation. It wasn't a migraine, it was uh, a malformation in my brain and it impacted my brain stem and I was going to be paralyzed uh, within a year. I, I didn't know that. I was experiencing numbness in my fingertips and my toes and these neurologists would poke my fingertips and toes and I'd tell I have the problems in my head. It's not in my fingers and toes. And they said, no, this, this thing you have, it's kind of like, it's a cyst. It's impacted and uh, you have to have this surgery. And to be honest with you, it was freeing because finally I knew what the real problem was. It wasn't migraines. It wasn't muscle spasms from overtraining because I didn't train. Um, it was something that needed to be addressed, so I went to an expert. We went to one of the top 25 neurosurgeons in the country, a guy named Roberto Eros. He was Cuban, so you know he's great. Uh, went to Harvard, and, um, and he told me exactly what the problem was, and he told me exactly what was the solution that we needed to this problem. And, and they operated on me, and everything by God's grace was fine. They said I was going to have to go to intensive care. Never went to intensive care. They said I was going to have to be on, on pain meds for a while. I was on extra strength Tylenol within three days. They said I was going to have to have MRIs every six months for the rest of my life. I had one MRI just six months after the surgery and then no more MRIs on my brain. I've had several on my knees just because I'm getting old, but nothing else on my brain. I needed an expert. I want to talk to you about the most important conversation in the entire Bible, and it's found in John chapter 3. And there's this guy, and his name is Nicodemus. We'll call him Nick. And uh, Nick was a Pharisee. He was a religious scholar. You can see he had a PhD in Torah. Like me, I have a PhD in New Testament. He had a PhD in Torah. Uh, Pharisees started memorizing the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, at the age of four. Uh, he's very powerful. He's a member of the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was like the religious supreme court. There's only 71 of those guys in the entire country, and he's one of them. He has a problem. He's achieved greatness. He looks great on the outside. He's powerful. He's wealthy, he's very, very smart, he's a man of influence, and he looks the part. Pharisees dressed a certain way. He has, on the outside, everything is put together for him. But there's a problem because he's using a lightweight solution to address a heavyweight problem. That's what I was doing. Uh, I was taking migraine medicine when I had a, essentially a tumor in my brain. I had a lightweight solution to a heavyweight problem, so I needed an expert. Nick, Nicodemus, needed an expert. Some of you need an expert. And you're addressing a heavyweight problem with a lightweight solution, and it is not going to help you. He had arrived. And I pictured Nicodemus in John chapter 3 on his balcony, sipping some uh, some pomegranate tea, or maybe an Arnold Palmer, because they drank tea back then, and the Bible says that he waits 
for it to be dark. He came to Jesus by night, John chapter 3 says. Now, he's, scholars debate, why did he go by night? Most likely, most people agree, he didn't want to be seen. He didn't want people to know that this religious heavyweight was going to this poor, penniless carpenter to ask him a religious question. It's all about honor in the first century Greco-Roman world, and he didn't want anybody to know. So he waits till it's dark. And he slips out, and he probably takes off his religious clothing, right? That shows kind of who he is. Just like I could tell you guys are King's students because of what you wear. I could tell who the trainers are by what they wear. I could tell who the faculty are because they dress a certain way. You could tell a lot about a person by the way they dress. We got the, got the Apple Watch going on. We got the preppy shoes going on. Uh, you could tell a lot. At, at the school I work at, Palm Beach Atlantic University, they don't wear uniforms, and people try to dress by kind of the impression they want to give. So there's people that wear athletic-type clothing, but you could tell they're not athletes. They just want people to think that they're athletes. So they got the watch, they got the shoes, they got the yoga pants, even though have never done yoga. And uh, so he probably changes his clothes. He probably gets his servant's clothing and puts it on because he doesn't want to be noticed. He doesn't want to be seen talking to this Jesus. He's embarrassed by What's going to happen? He's embarrassed by this problem. And so he slips out by dark. He's walking down these cobblestone streets. They're lit on one side and not lit on the other side. So I'm guessing he's probably walking on the dark side. Then he goes to this house and he knocks on the door. And they open the door. And there he is, Jesus. (laughs) And he steps out of the darkness into the light. And there's these disciples there, and they're usually sitting kind of in a circle, and Jesus is in the middle talking, and they would eat dinner sitting on the floor. And the disciples aren't religious guys. They're tough. Uh, They're like some of the members on our football team. Some of them are, uh, today they'd be tatted up. They were fishermen. They were longshoremen. They were rough guys, roughnecks, thugs. But they had an encounter with Jesus, and he had changed him. So when they see this Pharisee come in, they don't know if he's friend or foe. They don't know if Nicodemus Nicodemus is here to arrest Jesus or arrest them. They are not going to let it happen. Jesus somehow gestures and says, no, 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 he's, he's fine. Nicodemus, come in. He comes in. The disciples are at ease because Jesus says he's okay. Look at what he says. Verse 2 of John chapter 3. Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He calls him rabbi. He calls him teacher. He acknowledges him as a good teacher. Nicodemus has enough faith to believe that Jesus is a good teacher, but that's not enough. Nicodemus has enough faith to believe Jesus existed to believe Jesus could perform miracles, to even maybe believe in some of those miracles, but that's not enough. See, in order to believe and really experience eternal life, you have to cross the threshold. Not just believe that Jesus is a good teacher. Millions of people have believed that. They don't have faith in him. Not just believe that he performed miracles. You have to actually believe in him, not just in what he he did. So normally you would think that Jesus would say, Wow, Nicodemus, uh, you went to the the Cambridge of Torah school. Uh, You've accomplished a lot. You're a member of the Sanhedrin. You are all of these things. That's normally what would happen. Nicodemus calls him rabbi. Jesus should call him something of some term, some title of honor. Jesus doesn't do that. He never does. He doesn't pull any punches. Jesus says to him, unless you're born again, you will never see the kingdom of God. See, it's not that titles aren't important. It's just uh, they don't fit in the equation of Jesus' algorithm. I don't know what algorithm means. I just felt like saying it in front of students. (laughs) It's not that he doesn't care about titles and accomplishments. He just, in this conversation, it means very little to him. He says, listen, you need to be born again. 
Nicodemus is thinking literally. He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Then he says again, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Verse 7, you must be born again. Verse 14, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him may have eternal life. So he looks at Nicodemus, and Nicodemus says, uh, you're, you're a great teacher, and Jesus says, look, let's just get down to business here. You need to be born again. Birth. It's interesting. Birth is a passive act. You did nothing to be born. Uh, my uh, sister-in-law just 10 minutes ago, right before you started singing your, your song, which was the third song or the second song, uh, sorry, um, she had a, a boy, and so they sent us a picture. They named him Rex, very modern, very Latin. <laughs> and so then during the music, my son sent a text of a dinosaur, T-Rex, so there he's already making fun of the kid's name. And, uh, but uh, Rex did, did nothing to be born. It's a passive Act. I was there with the birth of my three children, Bernie, Nicholas, and Sophia. The kids did nothing to be born. Absolutely nothing. Uh, they congratulated the mom. I congratulated the doctor, the nurse, the anesthesiologist. They congratulated me, and I'm like, I was not involved in the delivery in any way, shape, or form. My goal was to not pass out, because it was C-section. So, see everything. And um, nobody congratulated the kids. Why? Because they didn't do anything. It was, it was a passive act. Nicodemus is not used to that. Nicodemus is used to works of man, not a work of God. Do this, don't do this, do this, don't do this. In fact, I would venture to say that some of you, that's what you think Christianity is about. Uh, don't listen to this. Don't hang out with this people. Don't do this. Don't do this, don't do this. In fact, I would venture to say, since I work at a Christian institution of higher learning, that for many of you, you think Christianity is just a big subtraction symbol. Just don't do any of these things and then you're going to be fine. That's exactly what Nicodemus did and it wasn't enough. So Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, your best works are not enough. They're not good enough. It's not about something you do, it's about something God has to do in you. You guys follow? It's something God has to do. Nicodemus, this is the, the difference between you and me. It's not about your good habits, it's not about your gestures, it's not about your hard work. You must be born again. Nicodemus doesn't understand this. He goes, what do you mean be born again? A, a do-over, a mulligan, a redo, a, a, a wiping of the chalkboard and getting a chance to start the equation over. And he tries to explain it to him. He goes, Nicodemus, it's like the wind. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where it's going. We can't conjure it up. It just moves. That's how the Spirit of God works in our lives. You can't control him. In fact, if you control him, it's not God. You need to be born again. It's not about the works of man. It's not about your ability to keep rules. It's not about your ability, like Nicodemus, to look good on the outside. That's not enough. It's not bad, but it's not enough. You need to believe. You need to be born again. See, this message is really for the, for the moral student. The religious one that knows how to say, uh, God bless you and amen and pray a nice prayer and, uh, and keep the rules. And all those things are good, but I'm telling you it's not enough. But this message is also for the person that's doing things you swore you were never going to do. Uh, I have a friend. She graduated from PBA. Her, her name's Carly. And uh, she took my Bible class, and she'd sit in the front. And my Bible classes are kind of intense. And uh, she cannot stop asking questions. 
She was devouring the class, devouring the notes, devouring the test, devouring the Bible. And we met for coffee at Einstein on campus. I said, Carly, tell me your story. She said, I came to faith just two years ago. I said, that's incredible. She said, I went to a, a Christian school. I went to a, a Division I college. She got a scholarship for cheerleading, D1. And um, she said, I had a boyfriend who, who was a Christian too. And we started doing things we shouldn't be doing. And, um, and he started uh, not treating me the way a young man should treat a young woman, um, pushing me morally. And when she said that, I thought, what a punk. Huh? And um, she started drinking, started doing drugs, got arrested. Went to rehab, arrested again. Her dad picked her up from prison in a brand new Range Rover. Leaving prison, she got drunk and flipped the Range Rover over. And she was going to kill herself. Her dad had had enough. He said, fine, do it. And um, he said, or... We're not doing rehab again, it's too expensive. You can go to Haiti on a mission trip and you can hold AIDS babies. That's all you do, you just hold them for the moms because uh, the moms are tired. So all you're gonna do for six weeks is just hold babies. <laughs> That's all she did. And there she has an encounter with God and she's born again. And she comes to faith. Not religion, not rules, not everything she had grown up with. She did VBS, she did a Christian camp, she did everything. She went to a good Christian school. I said, what was the turning point? She said, he started treating me like trash, her boyfriend. And I just started believing it. So I started treating myself like trash. I thought, what a punk. <laughs> Where is that guy? Let's get him. She was born again. And uh, I said, how do you feel now? She said, I'm washed. Uh, she said, I'm cleansed. <laughs> I said, cleaner than before. She goes, cleaner than before. See, so the message is not just for the religious rule keeper, the Nicodemuses in our group. The uh, message is for Carly's, too, that have found themselves doing things they thought they were never going to do. Stuff you're embarrassed about. Stuff you feel shame about. It's passive act. You just have to believe. God takes care of the rest. It's like a, it's like a birth. And then he says this, John chapter 3, verse 16. I know you guys know this passage. This passage is the, is the grand entrance to the Christian faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Uh, that verse begins with God and it ends with life because it's passive. It's God doing it. That's how you step from darkness to, uh, to light. You just believe. I did my dissertation on that word, belief. It's pretty boring. Uh, right now, you are believing that those seats are going to hold you up and so you're leaning on those seats with all of your weight. That's what belief means. It means to lean on something with all of your weight. Not just believe that it exists. Not just lean on it a little bit. You are putting all of your weight on those chairs. When Jesus uses the word belief here, that's exactly what he's saying. Do you believe in him? Are you leaning on the cross? His sacrifice on the cross for your sins. The fact that he rose again on the third day and one day will return as a ruling, reigning king. You believe. That's the only way to be born again. It's not about your ability to keep rules, friends. It's about simply believing in what Jesus did on your behalf, what he did for you. God loves, God gives, we believe, we receive.
Yeah, what about evolution, though? Uh, what about women in ministry? What about speaking in tongues? What about how the church should be run? What about the second coming? Those are great questions. You don't need to know all those things just now. You do need to know God loves, God gives, we believe, we receive. God loves, God gives, we believe, we receive. You must be born again. So what happened with Nicodemus? See, when Jesus spoke to um, the woman at the well, she had an incredible emotional reaction and went and told everyone. Some of you guys are like that. You're very emotional. Your personalities are like that. So when you have an encounter, you tell everyone. Others of us, uh, we're more chill. We process things internally. That's what Nicodemus did. The Bible talks, though, about Nicodemus in John chapter 19. He helped take care of Jesus' body after the crucifixion. Nicodemus came to faith. He believed. He was born again. He crossed from darkness to, to life. And so then he could say in glory, it's not just we believe that you're a good teacher. He could say, I believe that you are the savior of the world. It's personal. Huh? I believe. And because of that, you belong to him. When you believe, you, you belong. Nicodemus belonged to a very special group, but it, it, it didn't mean a lot to him. There was something missing because he was treating a lightweight problem. A heavyweight problem with a lightweight solution. Believing means uh, belonging. I talk to people, to students, to faculty, to church members all the time, and you could tell my relationship with them by what they call me. So um, some people call me Professor Cueto. So they're students. So our relationship is defined by professor students. Some of them call me Dr. Cueto, Dr. Cuervo. Dr. Kudo, Pastor Bernie, Padre B, Burn. Three people call me dad. And one calls me papi, but I'm not going to talk about that one. <laughs> That's for the marriage conference. <laughs> Now those three, they, uh, they did nothing to get to call me dad. They weren't involved in any way, shape, or form in the delivery. They didn't earn the right to that. It was a passive act. It was, it was a blessing from God. When you call God your father, when you tell God, I, I believe in you, he says, now you're my son. Now you're my daughter. No one can ever change that relationship. It's not about dead rituals. It's not about empty religion. It's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And um, that's what's missing. You're looking for belonging in great things. But that real solution is found only in your relationship to Jesus Christ. You don't need to know everything. Uh, 19 years ago, I stood in front of a church wearing a tuxedo that didn't fit really well. Um, and I said, I do. And I read a couple books and we did a little premarital counseling, but I had no idea what I was getting into. Absolutely no idea. All I knew is that I loved her and I was never going to leave her. You don't need to know everything. You just need to be able to tell them, I do. I believe. I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So if, if I could do this, if you don't mind, would you mind just bowing your heads and closing your eyes? I'm not going to make you stand up or raise your hand or anything like that. Just relax. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you. He's nudging you. You're realizing that maybe you're kind of like a Nicodemus. You've been um, playing the religious game. You've been keeping all the rules, but you realize there's something missing. Just remember the words of Jesus who loves you and says, you must be born again. How do I do that? Just believe. You pray this prayer out loud or silently in your heart with me. Dear God, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for my sins. 
I believe in him. Please wash me. Please cleanse me. I've made a lot of mistakes. I want to experience the power of the resurrection in my life. Help me to experience your love and to love you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, you might feel different. You might not feel different. God hears the prayer and rejoices in heaven. All I need you to do is just one more thing. If you pray that prayer, I want you to tell someone. I want you to tell Pastor Stephen. I want you to tell a professor. I want you to uh, maybe tell your pastor. All right, now I'm going to pray for you and we're done. Father, I want to thank you for uh, each and every student in this chapel today. I thank you for their gifts. I thank you for their talents. Some gifts and talents that they're not even aware that they have yet. And I just pray that throughout this school year, they would learn to trust in you, to lean on you with all of their weight, to acknowledge you so that you can direct them and guide them. And for those of you that call you their heavenly Father, let them know that there is nothing, absolutely nothing that they could do that will ever disqualify them from that relationship. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his reputation alone. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Pastor Bernie, for sharing.